Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Glad you joined us today on all major podcast platforms. And if you're so fortunate to be viewing this on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, which is growing, if you want to see our facial expressions, etc. I am very excited to have a special guest on today, definitely a celebrity guest and a rising star nationally in the fee-only advisor space. <laughs> Um, he has a very extensive background with Fortune 500 companies. I've known him and his father for a long, long time. His father was also a fee-only advisor. Um, his name is Adam Van Wee. Um, I'm going to have all of his information permanently on my site. He's going to have a page just like all of our celebrity guests are, have a page on theannuityman.com, and I'll have links to his site, links to his um, radio show, which is fantastic. I have been on that occasionally, but it is one of the best uh, radio shows you'll hear because it's, it's factual. It's non-salesy. I mean, they really get down to it. You know, Adam, I, I, was, I didn't know this, but he's a Tulane Green Wave person. The Green Wave is the, is the mascot of Tulane. So he actually got an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering of all things from Tulane. But that should tell you kind of who he is. He's very methodical. He's very pragmatic. And from a fee-only advisor standpoint, you want that. Got his MBA from Emory University. I mean, he is a, um, he's a star, native of Wisconsin, which makes him a cool Midwesterner. But he lives in Northeast Florida with me. You know, as you know, the Annuity Man is based in Las Vegas, Nevada. I spend time there, but also I have a home here in Northeast Florida. So Adam and I occasionally cross paths. But with that being said, welcome Adam Van Wee to Fun with Annuities. Thanks so much for having me, Stan. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to your insights on everything. Let's just jump right in because people don't want to hear about annuities. They want to hear about you and they want to hear about your take on a lot of things. Let's jump into inflation and rising interest rates. You know, you are a fee-only advisor. And for people that don't know who that, what that is, explain to them why fee-only and those two words in combination make sense and what people should be looking for for their non-annuity assets. Great question. Uh, fee only really is a way of doing business that puts both your advisor and you on the same side of the table. So your goals are aligned. When you, when you sell someone a product, there is a natural incentive to keep selling. And it doesn't necessarily, I'm not saying that all commissioned salesmen are bad people. I'm sure I hope not. I'm, I'm commissioned. I'm yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And I know that there are tons of them out there, but if uh, there is an incentive there to sell more mm -hmm. and that's how you grow in our business, we grow by growing our clients assets, which just happens to benefit them as well. So, so in a way it aligns your goals with your client goals. And we just felt it was the best way that we could set up our practice to, to help out our clients. Totally agree with it. Let's talk about inflation, Adam. I'm dying to hear your take on what Miss um, Yellen, our friend has to say about transitory inflation. At this point in time, if it's transitory, Adam, it's a long train. <laughs> yeah, a long train. And uh, we just saw the, uh, the Fed raise 50 basis points, the, the largest uh, hike in, in 22 years, I believe. And what do you know, the stock market's up big. So you just never know how these things are going to go. It's been dwindling, going down every day for about four months now. And then we finally get to the big announcement and what happens? It pops. Yep. You can't predict what's going to happen. But I think the the transitory remarks, if Yellen and Powell could go back and take those back, I have to think they would because they're looking pretty bad in hindsight. It's uh, it's not been transitory at all. We hit eight and a half percent last month and it does not look good for the future. Now, those Fed rate hikes should help that in the in the not too distant future. We're already seeing the 30-year the fixed mortgage went from 3% to 
almost five and a half percent. And that didn't take very long. It, was, it happened in less than four months. Um, so I think that we're, we're seeing a, a, an end in sight, but it's going to take a while to get these get inflation back down. And it's going to be a little painful while we do it. Do you think the Fed has the guts and the autonomy as they should have to not be bullied by this administration and the past one to continue to raise interest rates like they should? Uh, I think that now that Powell has more or less secured his second term, mm -hmm. that a little bit of that political pressure will ease. But I think that he waited as long as he did, in part because of the political pressure, which shouldn't affect the Fed. But in these highly charged political days, you, it's just hard to think that it didn't. Why did we wait so long? Clearly, inflation was ramping up. Clearly, to, to most people, it looked like it wasn't going to be transitory. I feel like there was a little bit of a hesitancy to raise rates prior to getting nom a second nomination. And let's hope they continue the, the track. Um, do you have a prediction of which I will not hold you to? Do you think they're going to hold <laughs> on to the, to the five or six or seven rate hikes that they initially talked about? I think my guess is that it, the track will look something like that, but that is has a big asterisk by it that says Definitely. it's subject to change. If we start getting into a situation where it looks like a recession is imminent, I, the Fed doesn't want to cause a recession. No one would benefit from that. I, I think that their goal would be to get a soft landing, they call it, but that's almost impossible to do. So the first sign of real trouble, that plan that they laid out could change dramatically. Obviously, the markets right now at the time of this taping, very volatile. I think they'll be volatile ongoing. What's your take and what are you telling your clients right now when it comes to volatility and their stomach starts hurting when they watch the nightly news? Well, it depends what type of client they are. If they're a, uh, especially a younger client with a lot of time to invest, I say, don't worry about it. This is your best friend. Mm -hmm. You're buying everything 10 to 20% off where you were buying it a few months ago. So in the long term, you're going to be fine. The, the clients that are older, closer to retirement or in retirement, we've already dealt with their portfolios. We'll have a certain percent of it in safe assets that aren't subject to market fluctuations, uh, or at least not to the degree that the stock market's fluctuating right now. And so anything that they need within about five years for cash for, to live on, it's already, it's already safe. So our clients aren't really freaking out right now. And that's, I think that's why they hired us in the first place. So if we hadn't done that, it'd be a little bit of a breach of our fiduciary duties. Uh, but the, for those of you that this is the first time you've experienced any real volatility, I think that's how you should look at it. If you have more than five years to invest, I would double down, buy more. Uh, you know that long-term American companies have a, they have a natural inclination to try and increase their profitability. And that's what drives stocks in the long run. So it's a little bit of a rigged game, but it's rigged in your favor if you have enough time to play it. Interesting way to look at it. We're talking with Adam Van Wee, one of the most well-respected and young bucks out there in the fee-only <laughs> ad ad advisory world. I get questions all the time. Hey, do you know anybody young, really, really good? Because I want a long, long-term relationship with my fee-only advisor. That would be Adam Van Wee. Um, by the way, you know, he lives in Northeast Florida and I'm there occasionally. He's a surfer. So that doesn't mean he's laid back though. One of the things I like about what Adam does, I'm very familiar with his practice because I have referred a bunch of people to him and not one person has said a word negative. But what I like about what he does is he, he obviously looks at each person's specific situation, but he handles risk and plans for risk, and his plans all involve de-risking the portfolio to the level that you tell him to do that. Can you cover de-risking portfolio and what that means from a 30,000-foot view and then maybe take the plane down from there? Sure, sure. I, I'd love to. I, uh, what, one thing we do is we normally leave a good portion of the portfolio in uh, non non-equities. So that means not stocks. So when you talk about that, traditionally you would think bonds, uh, maybe real estate, REITs, or gold, silver, um, to any type of commodities. So we, we diversify that way. 
but lately you've had to be really careful around that because if you just look at last quarter, great example, you saw our commodity funds went up around 27%, but bonds, which are supposed to be sort of the stable portion of your portfolio actually dropped 6%. So if you're in a traditional 60, 40 stock bond portfolio and the 40% that's supposed to be your, the anchor or the, the part that doesn't, that saves you when stocks get volatile, it wasn't happening. Stock, it actually hurt you worse than the stock side of the portfolio last quarter. So we started making some changes early, early last, this year and moving around our bond portfolio to really, really short dated, safe uh, type of securities that, that wouldn't be as subject to interest rate risk. And the other thing we looked at is moving into um, floating rate type of investments that would benefit from rising interest rates. So our bond portfolio did not drop with the market over the last four months. So you really need to be, it's, it's somewhat a, a process of being both um, analytical and investing for the long term, but also being tactical and looking at short term trends and saying, how can we lose or how can we avoid losing money when we know what's going to happen in the short term? And that's the mechanical engineering background that I feel makes you stand out amongst the rest because you're actually building the portfolio, no pun intended, but you're looking at things a little bit differently. When you talk about bond durations, what are you talking about? When you say short term, can you define that in duration speak? So duration is simply a measure of the, of your, your risk, your, your interest rate risk on a bond. And it usually has most most of it has to do with the time until maturity. So when you mm -hmm. buy a bond, it's issued for a specific period of time. You can buy it when it's issued, or you can buy it some at some point between issuance and when it becomes due. And the shorter time until it matures, the less your duration is going to be in general. So when you're talking about interest rate risk, you want to look at how long is it until that bond matures. So the closer that bond is to maturity, the less interest rates will affect the, the overall volatility of the bond. So I like to keep my durations really low in a rising interest rate market. And sure. that way you're subject to way less duration risk than you would be otherwise. And I think that's important because some, sometimes people just say bonds <laughs> and it's all encompassing. It's not. Um, if, you're, if you're holding long-term bonds here, it could be a little sketchy because of the valuation decrease as in, in, interest rates rise. When More you run into people, yeah, when you run into people with long bonds, are you trying to unwind those and shorten the durations? What, what, I know everything's a, a one-off strategy and customized, but when you see that, what's your initial thought? And then what's your, what's your then reaction and action to that? So if a client comes to us and they're holding individual long-term bonds that are paying decent uh, interest rates, we'd actually probably hold those because as long as the company is a solid company that we don't think uh, is in risk of default, because those even in the, while they will go down in value on paper in the short term, as they get closer to maturity, they'll actually come back up in value and pay out their par value once the bond matures. So those I wouldn't worry about. What I would worry about is if I saw someone holding an ETF that holds only long maturity bonds. If you look at the ETF TLT, it holds 20 plus year treasuries mm. and it's down almost 20% in the last year or so. That, that is just been a horrible investment. You, you, there's no reason to be holding that right now. You probably should have sold it six months ago and you still are probably better off selling it today and replacing it with something else. Can you comment on closed end bond funds as well? Because a lot of those are leveraged and people don't even know that. Can you kind of explain the pitfalls of a closed end bond fund? Because sometimes the yields look attractive, but as we all know, you have to look under that hood to see what the engine's doing, right? Yeah, I think with, with any investment, you're, that's, that's probably true. You should read your prospectus or at least have your advisor do it for you and make sure you know what you're getting into. Because, yeah, there's a lot of things like that that can look very attractive in the short term, but ultimately they, they may not pan out. And I think we saw this a lot with uh, 
Uh, over the last 10 years, it's been MLPs with really high returns. It's been uh, dividend portfolios really struggled when growth was all the rage. Mm -hmm. So I think no matter what it is you're looking at, including closed end bond funds, you should, you should really look under the hood and, and figure out what it is you're holding and what will be the, not what you get in the short term, but what you get if you hold it until for the longer term. With these fix, fixed investments like you know, REITs and these type of things, are you very concerned when you see something from a, from a liquidity standpoint? Because a lot of times these really attractive yields, whether it's um, you know, what, whatever it is, REITs, whatever, sometimes there's some liquidity provisions that can be prohibitive. Can you comment on that? We, I've never run into that personally, but I know that my dad and some of his colleagues have. They, mm -hmm. they, had, they had a problem with this um, probably 10 or 15 years ago. That's old with, guys, man. That's old guy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I easily could have had I been in the business already, but I've, I've, I'm only on year eight, so I, I just missed out on all the fun. Um, <laughs> The, uh, but yes, that is a real problem. So if you have a, especially with a private REIT, if, um, if there's a run on people trying to get out and the company yep. can't cover the cash flow going out, you're going to be in serious trouble. And private REITs are something that we stay away from. Although I'm not saying that all of them are bad. It's just not for us. The liquidity issues are too much of a risk for what we do. But you know, if it's if it's in your wheelhouse and you're a, you're a wealthy investor and that's something that you're interested in, do your due diligence. And I'm, there are lots of good ones out there. We just don't use them. We're talking to Adam Van Wee, and he does a lot of things. And he's um, fee only, but he does comprehensive financial planning. He does issue based consulting. If you have something specific for him to look at, and you know, obviously focused on asset allocation and management services to his clients. Um, you know, once you walk into Adam's office and his team starts working with you, um, I can't imagine what his retention rate is, but it's pretty darn good because you know that that side of the ledger is fully taken care of for sure. With that being said, Adam, and you know, everybody has their little political animal and where they're, where they're leaning both left and right. And we both have clients that are both Democrat and Republican, Libertarian, you know, uh, non-existent, don't vote for anybody. <laughs> but talk about, without getting on one side of the table or the other, can you talk about how politics affect the markets? Because, you know, people that are addicted to cable news think that it moves everything. But if you look at it, right. you know, there's only, what, a million or two million or three million people on the top rated shows out of 300 million people watching it. But let's talk about politics. How does it affect the markets, in your opinion? Yeah, so that's a, it's so true that we get so many clients or potential clients coming in and asking about, oh no, so-and-so got elected. Is my portfolio gonna go down? Is it gonna pop? And the answer is they, the market doesn't care. The market has gone up historically under both sides, uh, Republican and Democrat. It, it really isn't as related as people think. Now, there are specific policies that one side will do that will affect certain investments and vice versa. So when I think a great example right now is you look at the price of oil, there are, that's definitely been affected by the policies of the new administration, whether mm -hmm. you agree with it or not, it's, it just is. And it's uh, so there's a direct correlation between those two. Now, I don't, it doesn't matter to me which administration is in power. I want to know what's going to happen with energy stocks. So if the price of oil goes up, energy stocks are gonna do well, and that's something that you might wanna take a look at as an investor. So to some degree, politics does affect your money, but it's not nearly as much as people think. And really, the one thing that the politicians do have control over is your taxes. So when you see new tax policy passing through Congress, that can really affect your bottom line, and that you need to pay attention to. It doesn't look like there's going to be any significant tax policy changes in this year mm -hmm. or probably in the next few years. So the current tax policy policy should stay in place. And that makes it a lot easier to plan for your next uh, for next April. So I'm, I'm very fortunate or I feel very lucky that that is the case because it makes my job a lot easier when trying to do tax planning when I know what to expect. We've talked about this before. I mean, planning is personal. Planning is customizable. Planning is about 
the person's specific situation. I know for you and your beautiful wife, Jessica, and your two, two lovely young children, planning is about you guys. Planning is about your life. Same thing with me, with my two daughters and my wife, Christine. It's about our specific situation. Is it hard to get people to realize how customized this is from the standpoint of how you invest their money based upon the risk tolerances they provide and the answers they give you and the goals they lay out? Yeah, it really is. When we look at someone's financial situation, one of the first questions we ask is always about their family situation. So there, we ask about kids, we ask about spouses, we ask how their kids are doing on a personal level, especially if they're adults, because one of the biggest problems we run into is adult children coming back and asking for money from parents who are our clients. And nothing can drain you faster than trying to be nice to your kids. It's, it's crazy how many stories we've seen like That's that. True. And so part of what we do is incorporating the family dynamics into our practice. And it's actually worked out for us. It was an unintended consequence, but it's worked out really well. We have some multi-generational clients now where we have kids and, or we have the, the parents and then the kids. And now we even have a couple of situations where we have the adult grandchildren as clients. So it's, uh, we're really taking a look at the entire family up and down and making sure that everyone is taken care of and planned for. And that's the reason I wanted to have you on um, is because I want my clients and listeners to consider using your services for a continuation plan of the financial plan. So you're going to be here a while. God willing, we'll both be oh, yeah. here. But you're young. Um, you, you're very, very smart. You have a very, very unique and pragmatic way, mechanical engineering people, on how to do this. But if you're looking for a long-term advisor that can take your plan and transition it to your children, then transition it to their children, Adam Van Weeg is a person you should at least interview because I think that's a missing um, piece of when people choose fee-only advisors. I think they should be looking decades down the road as what's going to happen. And with that being said, and I'm kind of in your corner and pounding the table for you, Adam, because I do believe in what you do and, and how you approach things. Tell us how you work with the CPAs and lawyers with each, um, you know, each complex situation. Because everybody that comes to the table, if you are financial and you are the evil rich, right? You're going to have CPAs that are with you and, and lawyers that are side by side. I'm assuming you enjoy working with those two, two individuals or as many as needed to put together the team for these, for these people in retirement so that they can go live their life and enjoy chapter two. Can you talk about how that, how that works with your practice? Yeah, most of our clients do come to us with CPAs and lawyers. And we, if not, we can always recommend people. We don't get any kickbacks for that. Sure. We just have people that we trust and have worked with over the years and want to support their businesses because they're really good at what they do. But the, the, the ones who do bring them in, we, we try to meet them. We try to bring them onto the team, I guess. And, and really, your financial planner should be somewhat your your coach uh, of, of the team. So you've got, you've got all the different pieces, but the, the person sort of coordinating everything should be your financial planner who has the, the 30,000 foot view of what it is that you're doing and trying to accomplish. When it gets to specifics of, of drawing up a will or a trust, I, I can't do that, I'm not a lawyer, but I certainly know what most of my clients want and I've done it enough times that I can help guide them through the process. And I, and I think that's the service that they, that they value. Mm -hmm. And same thing with tax planning. We do a ton of tax planning during the year. We work with clients to make sure that, they are, that their income planning works out. They're, you'd be surprised how many people don't know about the income tax uh, consequences of withdrawing from IRAs or, or right. taking money out or, or any of that. So we work, we work with them through that process. We do tax loss harvesting at the end of the year. Typically, we, we, uh, we plan for RMDs. Uh, we do all of that. So it's definitely an integral part of our practice, even if we can't file a tax return or prepare a tax return or write a will. How do you Putin proof a portfolio? How do you war proof this thing? I mean, this is at the time of this taping, 
our friend from uh, Russia is, is a little aggressive and mm -hmm. unpredictable. People are calling about that, I'm assuming. What are you saying to them? Because he could do a myriad of things that could affect things short and long term. What are you telling people? Yeah, that's a tough one because it's it's almost at the at right now, a month ago, it was definitely hot. Everyone was calling about that. That's all we were hearing about. Uh, and, and it really seemed to be affecting the market. Today, it seems like things have, I don't want to say calm down, but it's definitely changed. There's more, the market's been reacting to way more interest rate news than Ukraine news. And, uh, but the threat is still out there for sure. Mm -hmm. If if we ever see anything go nuclear, mm -hmm. I, all bets are off. I mean, we, we'd probably go to cash immediately. And if, if it wasn't too late, I, I, I don't even want to speculate on that. Mm -hmm. We'd just be in such a world of hurt. Uh, even if it didn't affect America, it would still be just a disaster. I, I don't think, I'm not even sure you can plan for a scenario like that. You can. It, it, yeah, it's just too too terrible to think about. As far as the war goes, we are monitoring it closely to see what the potential ends could be because at this point, it doesn't seem like there will ever be an end. It seems like they're, yeah, no. they're, every day you look and they're, they're, one side is advancing, then retreating and uh, it, it's so hard to predict these things because predicting the moves of a madman uh, at this point are, are <laughs> extremely difficult. Thankfully, uh, I think that because the conflict is isolated right now, the potential is there that it won't affect the American markets too much more. So uh, I'm hopeful about that. As far as planning for further moves, I don't know what Putin's going to do, and it'd be really difficult to, to try and plan for that. But yep. I think getting through that initial period of volatility without making any drastic moves was probably the most important step. And you see that the market's been back reacting to the things that normally reacts to Fed rate hikes and, and earnings reports and things like that. So hopefully we're, we're through the worst part of it. Mm -hmm. Old codgers like me are all, will always say, well, there's always something happening. You know, there's always, it's you can look true. back and there's always wars and there's always issues and there's always midterms and there's always conflict and there's always strife, but we yeah, are a strong and company. And, and typically, um, do you agree with the, the fact that COVID, however horrific that was and is, it made us better and more efficient from a business standpoint? Well, the fact that we're talking on Zoom right now may point to yes on that. Uh, I think that <laughs> good answer. You're I right. Think that, yeah, it's so different now. I mean, we have we have clients that are, are located all across the U.S. and and we do this routinely for client reviews now. Uh, that wasn't something that was really part of our practice uh, until COVID hit. And now I think half of our clients who live in town want to meet over Zoom or over the phone because they find it so much more convenient. So, from a from a practicality standpoint and from a time management standpoint, it has just changed everything and probably for the better. Although I'll be the first to tell you, there's nothing like a face-to-face -face meeting to really cement a relationship. So mm -hmm. we try and get people in the office at least for the first couple of meetings, just to, just to get to know each other, learn about each other's quirks and, and make eye contact, that kind of thing. Are we in a housing bubble, Adam? Hmm. So I think that the potential for price depreciation is there, uh, specifically in areas that are not Northeast Florida, because right now, if you look around, there are so many people moving to Florida. It's It's been crazy. I'm sure you're seeing it stand in the traffic and sure. whenever you're here. Uh, but the and, and Vegas is another location I yeah. is, is the same. Um, I think that places like that, as long as people keep moving there, I don't know that we're building enough housing units to, to satisfy demand right now, but they're all leaving somewhere. And those are the places mm -hmm. that I would worry a little bit more about than the, than sort of the Sun Belt, as they call it, the mm -hmm. Texas, Arizona, uh, Nevada areas. So I, I think that the potential exists. I don't think that it's going to, I, I doubt that we'll see another big burst. We just saw one in the last decade or so. And, uh, it's unlikely that it would happen exactly like it did last time, mm -hmm. but could prices go down? Heck yeah, prices can go down. People think housing always goes up and that is not right at all. It is true. And, and um, you know, I have a place here in Northeast Florida near, near Adam and, you know, people are offering crazy amounts of money for 
houses, but I told my wife, I'm too lazy to move. <laughs> that means I'd have to pack everything up. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think there's an inventory issue that has to be resolved and it's going to take a while to resolve that. And as long as inflation and the distribution issues are there, that's going to do nothing but compound and get, and get worse from the standpoint of people trying to get into new houses, et cetera. I do think there's some challenges there, um, you know, going forward. Dying to ask you the next, next question, which is about crypto. Um, you know, obviously I believe in the blockchain technology because that doesn't involve just crypto. Crypto rides on top of blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is legitimate and used in all kinds of, you know, car manufacturing, healthcare services, et cetera. But what's your take on the, some people call it the tulip bulb stuff. If you don't know what I'm talking about, about tulip bulb, look it up, Google it. What do you think about crypto right here? Forget Bitcoin, crypto as a category. Sure. I, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more about the blockchain technology. I think that's, I think we're just touching the surface on that right now. I think I it's going to go a lot further and uh, maybe even be the next big thing. I'm not, I'm, who am I to guess at that? I'm not a, I'm not a tech uh, genius by any stretch, but I do like the technology it's built on. And, and I think there's applications for it that we haven't begun to touch. As far as crypto goes, if you want to, if you're a client of mine and you want to open a Coinbase account and trade crypto, go for it. And you can afford it and you, you don't, you know, but I would not risk more than you're willing to lose all of. So it's, it's just something that, that we don't look at as an investable asset class yet. And the reason for that is I just can't value it. When I look at, say, Walmart, they have cash flow, they have physical mm -hmm. inventory, they have buildings. I can put a value on all of that. When I look at crypto, the value is what the what everyone decides that they're willing to pay, the, what the, whatever the market makes it. And but I can't value it because I there's no process in place for me to do that. So for my clients, that's not something that we're putting our money into. I, I'm not saying it's a bad investment. I'm not saying it's a good investment. I just don't know because I can't determine the value. I guess the question for that is, is it an investment? Uh, for some, a lot of people consider it. A lot of smart people consider it. I know. Uh, yeah. And so the Peter Thiel's of the world and the, and the really smart people, and I'm sure they're right and we're wrong. And I'm sure Buffett's wrong and his, you know, Charlie, his, compatriot at uh, Berkshire is wrong, but they came out strongly recently about they did. Bitcoin. I'm not sure I'd be that strong about it. You know, I've said on previous podcasts that I think that the government's looking at it from a taxation standpoint and a trackability of the fund standpoint oh, yeah. and to do away with inflation standpoint. That scares me, obviously, that, uh, you know, we're talking about the United States government handling crypto, but I think it's eventual. Do you, do you see the government tiptoeing into this space and then creeping in larger as time goes on? Absolutely. Anytime there's a source of potential untaxed revenue or capital gains, <laughs> they're going to be all over it. And they are. They're, they're, that's definitely on their radar and they're already making moves to get it, uh, get it further under their scrutiny. So if you have large gains in crypto you've never paid taxes on, look out. I, I think it's coming. I do too. I mean, if they're talking about taxing unrealized gains, which could be the dumbest idea I've ever heard, that's as dumb as me wearing high heels to play basketball. Maybe it's dumber. I'm not sure, Adam. We got to think about that for a second. But anyway, <laughs> it's from, a vi from a visual standpoint, I just did a visual on that. Man, that's not pretty. But, no. but, but I just, you know, it, it's disturbing kind of where this is where this is all headed um, from the standpoint of taxation. Obviously, when we print money like we've printed, they're going to have to tax somebody. And, uh, you know, once they start talking about billionaires tax, they're looking at you as well out of the left eye there as they're looking to the right eye to the billionaires. With that being said, as people walk into your office this year, um, and we're, we're taping this for you people down the road, we're taping this in 2022. Um, what are people asking? What's a consistent theme of concerns or is it just the same old thing, different year? No, it's a different thing, different year, but it's the same themes. It's uh, with our, with our older clients, it's always where are we headed? I don't like where we're 
had a, and it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's, it's both sides that ask <laughs> right. that question. Um, but I always tell them that, you know, your parents said the same thing, I worry about the next generation, and their parents said the same thing, I worry about the next generation. And so as unique as it feels to your, your experience, it's really not, it's different because it's, it's, it's the time is now and, and, and the, the issues are slightly different and the technology is different, but every generation worries about what's coming after them and all the change and, and that type of thing. And the, the fact is America has always found a way through these difficult times. We've been in this mm -hmm. before. Uh, we made it through the the 60s and 70s. There was some some real problems back then, especially when you got into the 70s with inflation and but we had good 20 music, but rates. very good music, Adam. I Excellent mean, music, no doubt about it. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not even going to comment about today's stuff, but exactly. that, yeah. So it's uh, but every every generation says that about too that our music was better than what, what it came after. So so you've got you've kind of got this recurring theme that nobody nobody thinks about when they're saying these things but every generation says it and we've always made it through it would be a surprise if this was the first time in history that had not been true i would be shocked i think we're going to be just fine i know i'm raising my kids to to take the torch from me and i'm sure you're doing the same stand and uh and and all of our all of our peers are as well so I think we're going to be okay. But that's the question I get all the time. And I kind of give that same speech and people either agree with that or think I'm crazy. And either way, I, I, I still believe it. Are there any unique hurdles for retirees at this time? I think that being in a coming out of a 10 year zero interest rate environment is somewhat unique. I don't think that we've ever been in that exact situation before. It was great for equities. It was mm -hmm. not great to be an older person who didn't want to take any risk. You couldn't buy a CD. You couldn't yeah. buy a bond that paid anything. Actually, so getting back to that, I know a lot of my clients are looking forward to it. So rising interest rates to them are short-term pain for longer-term gain. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a pretty unique issue. We've, we, there wasn't anything in the playbook to go back and look at and say, how do I treat a 75-year-old's account when I can't get any money out of fixed income? I agree. And the global nature of the markets all being attached in real time is, is kind of unique as well. Because, you know, when I started in the business in 87, you know, your dad and I were kind of doing at that time, you know, same thing. And by the way, um, Adam's father, Steve Van Wee, is still his co-host on his radio show. And it's one of the best. And they had their uh, on their site, which we'll have a link to their recordings of their radio show. But it's great. They take calls and and it's it's one of the best shows I think of the country, but just happens to be here in Northeast Florida. Um, for the person out there that that's interviewing you, or maybe they say, you know what, I don't want to interview him. I want to stay with my brother-in-law, the advisor, or my brother-in-law, or my my sister's son, the advisor, or this guy that I like playing golf with as an advisor. For those people that don't want to interview and don't want to change, what are some of the questions that you would have them? ask those advisors to hold their feet to the fire better than they are right now? I think there's a couple of key words that you need to ask your advisor. And if, if they answer correctly, they'll be very enthusiastic about giving you the right answer. And the first one is, are you a fiduciary? And all that means is, do you have to put your, my best interest ahead of yours, if, if I'm asking as the, as the client? And to us, that just seems such to be such a simple concept, why mm -hmm. would you not put your client's best interest ahead of yours? How else are you going to get referrals and grow your business? If you're consistently putting your own, <laughs> your own, it, it ain't going to end well, your clients, it ain't gonna end well man. I know you're, you feel the same Stan. Yes. Uh, we've had that talk many yeah. times, uh, but ask if they're a fiduciary, if they are, they will gladly tell you yes. Mm -hmm. The next thing is I would ask how much they're getting paid. Every quarter we send out a statement that says exactly what we got paid. So if anyone ever feels like they're getting ripped off from us, they can at least come and show us the invoice and tell us why, and we can have that discussion. But we're not hiding how much we get paid in backdoor deals and getting paid to hold certain funds in their account. Which That's none of that exists with him. So none of that stuff. No. Nope. I mean. So That's that's something that if you're, if you're fee only, that's something that should be very transparent. And why would you hide what you make from, from your own client unless you're not proud of what the work you've done? 
And so I think those are the two key things, being a fiduciary, being fee, fee only. And if you're not fee only, how do you get compensated and how much? It really is that basic. And with that being said, um, I came from that model of brokerage firms with the big marble offices and the big towers, you know, Dean Witter and Payne Weber and UBS and Morgan Stanley, or as I like to call it, Morgan Stanley. Do you think, and no offense to people out there working there, because I still have friends in that space, but do you think that is a broken business model in the future? Because it's going to, it's hard for me to envision younger people adapting to that type of transactional model. Do you agree with me on that or do you have a different insight? I think that I think that you're probably correct about that. I don't think it's going away anytime soon, but there has been a clear trend of firms and teams breaking away from the large wirehouses and going to RIAs and it I I haven't seen it slowing down at all recently. It mm -hmm. seems like every other day there's an article about a, a $500 million or billion dollar team that leaves one of the big places and either joins a smaller firm or, or breaks off or, or does something of that nature. And it doesn't seem to go the other way very often. So if that's any kind of indication, I would say you're exactly right. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with, and I'm not going to mention one of the firms with, that was my final exit out of the building, is when they started dictating um, kind of the ratio of things that we had to sell, whether we wanted to sell them or not. And that wasn't the way that I entered the business where it was completely autonomous. You could build your book of business however you wanted to. I chose municipal bonds and did that, but I don't think you could do that anymore. Number one, a lot of municipal bond offerings aren't available, but, um, you know, uh, it is what it is. Um, I think that people, we are in a do-it-yourselfer type mode. I know my business model is a direct-to-consumer, do-it-yourselfer, run your own quotes. We're the middleman to get you that highest contractual guarantee. But obviously, annuities aren't for everybody. And even if they are, you have to put them in proportion and allocate them properly. But how does a do-it-yourselfer, the self-proclaimed A personality, pound the table person listening and viewing this, listening to the podcast or viewing it on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, can, is there, and I hate to use this word, hybrid model of do-it-yourselfer working with a fee-only Adam Van Wee? There, to some degree there is, but okay. it's our our business model really is not for the do-it-yourselfer and I am a hundred percent supportive of the do-it-yourselfer. If you, if someone comes to us and wants to meet with us and decides that they want to do it on their own, I'll even give them some advice and, and tell them what I wouldn't, would not do in their situation. That is fine with me. We're, our business is not for everyone and everyone does not need us. So that's okay. But if somebody does want to work with us, we do have some smaller clients that uh, pay us a monthly fee and they, they utilize us as sort of a sounding board and we give them advice, but we don't manage all of their assets. A lot of their money's in a 401k anyway. Okay. And um, that's a relatively newer concept introduced by, I don't know if it was introduced by Michael Kitsis, but he made it quite famous. He's a, he's a big wig in, in the RIA space. He and is. And we've had our battles. Him. Michael and I have had our had okay. our battles on some things, but I, I, I did not totally, know that. yeah, I totally respect what he says about financial planning. Yeah. He said some um, uninformed things about annuities, which is fine because okay. he's, he's got his own, he's got his own reason to point people to what he's doing. But anytime someone steps out and is not factual about annuities, I'm going to have to call him out. I did one recently on Mr. Dave Ramsey, who did a video on annuities that mm -hmm. was so horrific. It would be like Adam be like me doing one on ballet. Um, and I know nothing about ballet. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, you know, that's the, the issue out there. There's a lot of mis misinformation, not only in the annuity space, but the financial planning space. Um, there's a lot of noise. How do people um, prevent themselves from falling for the, the, the slick advisor, the, the too good to be true stuff that's out there? Um, I'm not saying the bad chicken dinner seminars from the annuity standpoint, but there's a lot of bad advice seminar type stuff that's out there in the non-annuity space. Um, there is. How are you, 
What's your thought on that? Obviously, you're, you're, you're like me, you don't like it, but how do you explain it to people and ground them into making a better decision and not falling for those things? Because as I tell people, in retirement, there's no mulligans. Mulligan is you right. get to, you hit the bug in the golf, you hit the ball in the water, you say, yeah, I'm going to hit another ball. No, there's no other ball. How do, you, no, how do you get people from not having to try to take a mulligan? you're out of money, you're either out of money or you're going back to work. And that's not what any retiree wants to hear. So you're, you're exactly right about that. No mulligans. And if you are sitting in, in front of an advisor who is promising you returns that don't sound right, and he won't be specific about how he's going to get them, or she won't be specific about she's going, how she's going to get them, and it just doesn't feel right, run. Don't walk. Run away from that. It's... It, it, we see it just entirely too often mm -hmm. and it doesn't even matter what the presentation is, whether it's a dinner or just a one-on-one -on -one meeting. But when, whenever you hear, especially in finance, that something that is promising 18% returns with no risk, that is, it's, you just know it's a scam. You know it is. Sure. Trust your gut. It's, it's not that hard. A, a normal uh, advisor will not promise you a return, will tell you, there is going to be good years and bad years, but over right. time, they should be more good than bad. And it just, it's usually, it's almost always follows the same pattern of low risk, high reward. And if you put your money with me, we'll get you X, Y, and Z, and then serve it on silver platter. And it never ends up well for the investor. And full disclosure, Adam and I are on a constant search for the um, pill that we can take to to create the six pack abs we once had. Adam has yet to find it, I'm still looking. So if anyone has that out there, but that's what we're talking about. You know, Adam, you worked for Fortune 500 companies um, a while back before you made the decision to help people um, with their finances and retirement. What was, the, what was the fork in the road moment that brought you to that point? Uh, oddly enough, it was actually 2008. If you remember 2008, it was not a great year in the market. <laughs> and I had was fortunate enough to have had a, a very good job at that time, which I actually kept. And it was surprised. I was surprised every day that I still had a job. My 401k, I just hit a huge milestone in it. And then about six months later, I opened my statement and it was half. And mm -hmm. I called my dad. I was distraught. What do I do? It was the most money I'd ever had. I, I can't believe this happened. Am I, am I, what mistakes did I make? And he said, don't worry about it. Is it in the S and P 500? He said, yes. He said, double down, max your 401k, do it right now. And I did, I took his advice. And before I knew it, not only had I surpassed my previous goal, but or level, but so far beyond it because I had accumulated so many shares at a low price and it just really taught me the power of, of long-term investing and buying the dip and all of the important lessons that, that people, people, their natural inclination is to sell high or, or to, sorry, to sell low and buy high mm -hmm. and because it, it, because they sell out of fear and they buy out of greed and that's the exact wrong way to do it. You need to, you need to buy when there's blood in the streets and that is the way to do it. And that was the moment that I realized that I wanted to go work with him and I started studying for my CFP mm -hmm. and eventually passed the test and joined him. Which was a great move for everybody involved. And I'm glad you, you did it. What makes you get up in the morning? What makes you passionate to know that this is what you are put on the planet to do and that you're going to be doing this long term? What is that light that drives you? I think I have the best job in the world. I, I really do. I get to help people. I get to deal with money, which has always been a passion of mine. Every day is different. And I don't get bored at work. I love going to my job. It's, it's just a great job. I, I really, really can't imagine myself doing anything else. I feel extremely fortunate. I went through a bunch of terrible jobs. Even my good jobs before were terrible. I just didn't <laughs> you didn't know, know it at the time. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what you're telling me is if there is a um, middle-aged professional surfer circuit, you're, you're still going to be a, one of the best fee-only planners on, yes. in your off Unfortunately. schedule. Unfortunately, my, my relative success in this business and my relative lack of athleticism dictate that I will be doing this for a good long time. 
<laughs> I hear you. One last question. It's been great having you on. I certainly want you to have you on uh, ongoing so you can give us your insights as things change and morph in the world that we live in. But I do this with every celebrity guest. It's my mic drop moment. And I want you to leave us with the nuggets of wisdom that only Adam Van Wee can do. So mic drop moment. Adam, go. Uh-oh. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to give us words of wisdom right here. Mic drop, <laughs> mic drop moment. Go. Yeah, I think that I think that right now we're going through a pretty tough time in the market. We've been getting tons of questions about it, and I, I, I know that it's tough. And I know, especially if you're a recent retiree, it's you're probably scared out of your mind right now. The thing you have to remember is that time is on your side. Even if you start just started drawing on your portfolio, some of that money will not be used for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So in some ways, you are a retiree who needs the money now. But in, on, in the other side of the portfolio, you are a young investor with a long time to wait. So don't look at your whole bucket of money as one bucket. You have to break it up into separate buckets. And remember that this will pass. The market will continue to go up at some point. It will recover and then go higher and don't panic don't do anything stupid just stay the course and it will reward at some point point. and you know you said time is on my side of course i have to do my mick jagger thing right time <laughs> is on my side yes it is i think that's enough right there that's that now you know why i'm the annuity man and not uh, lead singer of a very good rock band but uh <laughs> Adam, thank you so much for being on. I want to thank everybody on all the major podcast platforms and the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, making us one of the fastest growing financial podcasts on the planet, if you can believe that. But the reason is we bring on people like Adam, who's very, very smart, and we don't talk about annuities most of the time, which is the key to podcast success. And with that being said, thank you for joining Fun with Annuities, and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get, and that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities.